we know that wax is flammable, we want to be really careful about how we melt it. You never want to melt wax over direct heat. So if you're going to start with an entry level system, I recommend getting yourself a double boiler. That's a pot that sits inside of a pot. If you actually can't get a double boiler, I picked this one up at the thrift store. This is enamel, which is great, except for the little scratches here. It's great because it um, has no seams. The double boiler helps keep the wax off the direct heat. So that's key. In terms of how you're going to melt it, you can melt it on your kitchen stove, or I prefer actually using my Coleman stove top because that means I can take it out of the kitchen. Wax is a fairly messy craft, and in the kitchen it can be really difficult to keep clean. I've upgraded, and if you get the chance, I highly recommend it. This is a double-walled melter, which means that it's not direct heat, but it's consistent throughout the entire melter. It takes about an hour to an hour and 15 minutes for me to melt about 30 pounds of wax, and I can guarantee that the wax coming out of the spout is the temperature that I set it at. So it makes pouring my wax at different temperatures really easy. When I use the double boiler, I want to double check my temperature of my wax all the time. It's exposed to air, I'm melting less of it, so it takes more time to melt. There's a lot of um, little tricks of the trade that are going to come in handy when you're using the double melter that don't apply at all once you upgrade to your big melter, which is really great. To finish your candles, you're going to need to get a skillet. This is the first skillet that I got for my candle making set, and I picked it up at the Goodwill for it looks like $8.99. Um, it was really handy for a long time. The surface heats and I'm allowed to melt the candle. There was a couple downsides to this. The size was one of them. Additionally, it didn't have a little hole for the wax to come out, so it would build up in the skillet and I'd have to empty it out every once in a while. So I upgraded. Uh, for about $35, you can get one of these at a big box store. It's a flat skillet. And what's great about this flat skillet is that it has a little hole in the front here that allows the wax to drip out into a bowl that I catch it in. This is really handy so that the surface stays wax free and doesn't build up. The buildup of the wax can be dangerous in terms of fire, so I want to keep this skillet as clean from wax as I can, even when I'm using it. The next item that I really like to have is my Van Marie. I bought it at a restaurant supply store. Um, it's a food warmer, basically, and it's filled with a hot water that I keep warm throughout candle making, and it allows me to keep pots hot while I'm doing other projects. So if I have wax that I need to keep warm, I can use the Van Marie to do that very easily. What's really nice about the Ban Marie is it keeps the wax off of the heat, so once again, it's an indirect heating method. It's really safe and secure. If you can't afford a Ban Marie, which is totally understandable if you're just starting to make candles, you can use the same type of system on your stovetop. Use a large saucepan and just put a pot inside of that, or even your pour pots can hang on the side of that. And your stovetop can do that for you. So remember, there's lots of different options in terms of melting. The one key is to never melt your wax against direct heat. So as long as it's indirect heat, you're good as gold. Have fun and melt your wax safely. So now you've melted and poured your candle and it's time to cool. Really, you do not need a cool bath. All candles can cool at room temperature slowly over time. However, I'm a little impatient, so whenever a project allows it, I use a cool bath to cut the cool time down in half. Now the rules on a cool bath typically are you can use anything that can hold water, a Rubbermaid tub, a galvanized bucket, anything that can hold water can work. The one thing you don't want to use is your sink. Chunks of wax will inevitably fall off your project and end up in your plumbing. And wax and your plumbing do not mix. So using another item outside of your sink is great. You want to make sure that you fill the water high enough so that the candle sits inside, leaving about an inch just out of the water. You don't want to put a mold in that sticks out too much because then the mold will cool unevenly. The bottom will cool faster than the top. So when you put your candle molds in, you want to make sure to adjust the height so that it leaves just about an inch. You can adjust the height by putting in slate tiles for your shorter candles or just have two tubs, one for tall and one for short. Once again, cool tubs are a total option. Not necessary, all candles can, can cool at room temperature. But if you're impatient like me, use a cool bath. Another way to cool candles is in the fridge. This is a great way to release candles that are stuck in the mold. It's important never to leave a candle in longer than 10 minutes. If you leave it any longer, it can crack. Outside is also a great place to cool candles, especially if you live in a cold place like me that gets snow yearly. Putting a candle in a snowbank will definitely cause it to crack, but putting it outside in the cold air for a short amount of time should be okay. 
The one thing you really want to pay attention to is the temperature variation. If it's really drastic, leave it for a short amount of time. So when you put your water in your cold, cool bath, it's not cold water, it's cool water. So no ice cubes or anything that's going to make it frigid. Keep it cool, but not freezing cold, because that drastic change in temperature will cause cracking in your candles. And once it cracks, it can't go back. Mm -hmm. Wax is a petroleum-based product with a flash fire point as low as 300 degrees. So it's really important to take a few safety precautions to make sure that your candle making experience is safe and reduce your fire risk. One of the first things is to always have a fire extinguisher on hand just in case. If a fire does occur, you want to treat it as an oil fire. Once you're melting your wax into a boiler, you want to make sure to check the level of your water regularly. The water will evaporate once you set it on heat, and if you're making candles all day, you will definitely have to replenish your water supply. If you've upgraded to a double-walled wax melter like I have here, you're going to want to check the level of your water regularly. Your melter should be filled with wax to at least three inches from the top. Once you get halfway past the halfway point of your melter, the heat inside is going to exceed the temperature that you've set. So checking the temperature of your wax regularly can keep that wax safe. You can turn down the thermometer and adjust it there. You never want to leave your wax melting unattended. The flash fire point of wax is somewhere between 3 and 400 degrees. So being in the room is really important because the fire will happen in a flash. So staying nearby can help you handle that accident or emergency if it does happen. Preparation is crucial and taking time to prepare your area properly is so important. Haste makes waste and any time that you spend preparing is going to cut your cleanup time in half. So take the time, prepare your, area prop prepare your area properly before you start making candles. You really want to make sure that you secure your newspaper so they don't shift as you're making your candles and create empty spots. It'll also help if any wax does spill, your nice seams are all closed. And that looks good. So we're going to really coat our stove well, as well as we can with as many pieces of tin foil as it takes. I like to use recycled tin foil so that I'm not wasting. So this is pieces of tin foil that I used already and I'm just reusing. If you're going to make candles, the best place to make candles is either in a craft room, garage, or outside. The last space you want to do it is your kitchen. If this is your last resort, you really want to take time to set your area properly. Cardboard on the floor, several sheets of newspaper on your counters, tin foil on your stove top. Those steps will cut your cleanup time in half and really protect your kitchen from damage. You'll also notice that I'm placing all of my cookie sheets on cookie coolers, on cooling racks, and that's because the wax can heat the bottom of these cookie trays and even seep through newspaper. If you do end up making a mess and having some things to clean up, there's a couple ways that you can do that. You can use your chunking tool to scrape any um, pieces of wax that are on hard surfaces, but remember this does have a hard knife edge and can damage the surface, so be really careful. You can actually rub an ice cube over the chunk Sometimes if it's a big, large chunk that's spilled and that'll help pop it out, you can use an iron on top of brown paper bag, newspaper, or paper towel, especially if it's fabric, carpet, or anything porous that can pull wax out. And then your final thing that you'd want to use is a chemical wax remover. You can find them in lots of craft stores. You can actually find them in hardware stores and sometimes in grocery stores. The wax remover usually does the trick 
but it also can be a kind of a harsh chemical. So always test it before you use it on a surface that you're really um, loving and don't want to damage. So there we go. We've prepared our space. We've taken the time to do everything we need to do to prevent the wax from impacting our area, and we're ready to make candles. So the following segment is discussing mold preparation and we're going to talk about how you wick all different kinds of molds from container molds to found objects to metal molds. <clears throat> it's really important to go over this in detail because one of the things that irritated me most when I started making candles was that the books didn't fully explain this process and this is the key to successful candle making. If you don't wick your candle properly, it'll either spill wax when you pour it or it won't burn properly. So let's start with found objects, which is probably where you'll start as a candle maker. It's a really inexpensive place to start. Milk cartons are great. Uh, you can also use um, cocktail glasses, shot glasses, and one of my all-time favorites is recycling candles that you've purchased that you've burned. You can clean the glasses and reuse them, and we'll go over this in recycled candles. So let's talk about wicking a milk carton. To start off with, you're going to want to clean the milk carton thoroughly. You might want to do this at least a day or two ahead because you're going to need the milk carton to dry completely before you use it. So clean it with soap and water, leave a dry paper towel inside to soak up any excess moisture, and then set it aside, wait for it to dry completely, and then you're ready to wick your mold. So I have one here that we're going to get started with, and you're going to want to grab a pair of scissors, and this is the tricky part. Grabbing the sides of the mold to give it, uh, the milk carton to give it support, you're going to grab your scissors, separate them, and puncture it. And I'll tell you, I pre-punctured this to make it a little easier, so if you're having difficulty with it, you can stuff the milk carton with newspaper to give it a little support. Next, we're going to grab some wicking, and this wicking is for this size mold, and I've double checked it, and I've even test burned one, so I know exactly. So when you're measuring your wicking, you're going to want to leave an inch at the bottom and about an inch and a half at the top. This is going to be necessary for finishing off and taunting your wick. So we're going to cut that little piece. I'm going to grab a skewer, and this is a handy dandy little trick. I'm going to wick this through the hole, and it, the stick is just going to help me push and thread the wick through. Then I'm going to grab it from the underneath and pull it through. At this point, you can either use a wick pin or you can use a screw. I typically use screws. They're six and three eighths are the size that I like because it has the threads that allow me to kind of just wedge it in there. Now that you have that done, you're going to grab your plumber's putty. The plumber's putty is crucial because it's going to seal the base of your mold so when you pour hot wax in, it doesn't leak out the bottom. So because you're carton is somewhat weak, you're just going to place it like that, make sure you cover everything, and then stomp it and push down with your hand inside. This is going to make sure to seal the plumber's putty all the way around. You then grab your wick, hold it tight, your stick across the top of your carton, you go over your stick, around the front of the wick, and through the hole. And ta-da! You have a wicked milk carton ready to rock and roll. Our next item that we're going to wick is um, a container candle. And we're going to do this next because this is probably the next thing that you'll um, find to use. So we're going to use container candles. If it's a simple container candle that you've used before, you can actually buy pre-wicked tabs and just place inside and rock and roll. It's that easy. You're going to want to make sure that the wick extends about an inch above the mold so that you have some wick to burn after you've filled the mold with wax. So that was really easy. Now say you have, say, a shot glass and you don't have a wicking that's appropriate for this um, height. You can custom make your wicking. So we're just going to measure this. And once again, I'm going to want to give about an inch above the lip of the glass. I'm going to trim the wick. Then I'm going to grab a handy dandy little wick pin here. And I'm going to thread it up from the bottom through the top. And when I have it nice and straight, I'm going to grab a pair of needle nose pliers and I'm going to pinch to secure the wick pin to the wick. Excellent. Now you're ready to just set inside. If you're having trouble with the wick staying up tall and straight, a nice little trick is to grab your um, wick stick that you use for wicking pillars and just bend the wick over. That'll make sure that it stays nice and straight. 
Our final object that we're going to wick are metal molds. This is the item that you're going to use the most of, and this is exactly what it looks like as a finished product. Very similar to our milk carton, very similar. So we're going to go over that wicking tie again. With a metal mold, you're going to do the exact same thing. You're going to start with a wick. You're going to thread it through the hole. And this one you can see I didn't need the wooden skewer, it just slid right in. And then you're going to use a 6 8 screw or a wick pin either way. And you're going to turn it about a half a turn. You only want the screw to be secure. You don't want the screw all the way in through the candle. Because when you're building your candles, you're actually building them upside down. So this particular candle was built like this. Oops, sorry, built like this. And at the end of the day, when you take your candle out and it's all said and done, your candle goes like this. So you build like this, comes out like this. Really easy and straightforward. Now, now that I have my wick pin in there, I'm going to grab plumber's putty and I'm going to use a nice generous ball. I'm going to ball it in my hand to get it nice and warm. It's important when you're doing the bottom of your candle not to be stingy on the plumber's putty. Plumber's putty is recyclable. You can use it over and over and over again. Um, it's not a one-time use product, so you can use whatever you're using now on your next candle making session. So use as much as you can to really cover that and get a nice covering. If you're stingy, the wax can break through and leak, and that's a mess to clean up, so it's much better to prepare and actually give enough plumber's putty. Your next stop is to wick the top. So you're going to hold it taut, you're going to go over the stick, around the front, and through the hole. I'm going over this a couple of times because when you're all said and done and you're coming to take your candle out, if it's a problem, you can just slide your wick right out and your stick will come, or your wick will come straight. Simple as that. So now we've wicked those molds. The last mold that I want to show you is uh, muffin tins. This is probably the easiest project you can do. Muffin tins are great. You can use various size muffin tins, but remember to change your wick size with the size of the muffins that you're doing. And when you um, take them out, they can be fun little floaters. So don't just look at items in the craft store. Go to the hardware store, go to the thrift store, look around for really fun items that you can wick. So we've wicked our candles. Now let's get ready to pour.